Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to another edition of New Zealand US Council webinars for a pre-election series in the United States. My name's Leon Grice, I'm the chair of the NZ US Council and our guest today is Derek Shearer, uh, uh, live from Los Angeles. Uh, welcome, um, Derek, it's wonderful to have you in this um, webinar today. Thank you, Leon. Hello to everybody in New Zealand. And I'll just do a little background about Derek. Um, I have to start with the fact that uh, when I was living in Los Angeles, um, uh, Derek and his wife, Sue Toygo, became uh, very close friends. So just declaring that as a conflict in, in terms of the perspective of this interview, we're very um, uh, lifelong friends. Um, now, Derek has an a, a impressive career. He was in Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign. So he was right in the middle of, of um, uh, campaigning for uh, the presidential election. After that, he went into the administration, the Department of Commerce, uh, and then went to Finland as the United States an ambassador. Uh, and his claim to fame there, I think, uh, well, it was, a, it was a tough time in terms of the Cold War. So the US-Finland relationship was right on the front line with uh, the end of the Soviet Union um, and uh, what was happening in terms of uh, Russia's um, uh, emergence out of the uh, ashes of the Soviet Union. Uh, but he also um, pioneered some amazing cultural diplomacy. Uh, he hosted James Brown uh, in Finland, which is uh, an amazing uh, combination, James Brown and Finland. Uh, and then at the end of it, he was uh, his nickname became from James Brown. He became the Ambassador Dude, which I think is a, is a great story. He's uh, now teaching at Occidental College and has been for some years. And uh, that's a uh, claim to fame at Occidental as it was the first university that uh, President Barack Obama went to before he went to Columbia University. I said he was married, he's married to Sue Toigo, Toigo who is in, um, uh, in finance and uh, runs a major foundation um, supporting uh, uh, people of uh, color and minorities into senior roles in the finance industry. Uh, and my son, um, his big story about Derek is, is that they both share the same love of Tom Lehrer songs and their favorite song is the Vatican rag. And the thing that really impressed my, my son is that uh, Derek says he's met and talked with Tom Lehrer. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're talk, here to talk about the election. Uh, and also uh, where, where uh, Derek sees the election going, what the key issues are. Uh, and after that, we're also going to be looking uh, to talk to uh, Derek about diplomacy and where he thinks uh, the United States is heading in terms of diplomacy after the election this year. So Derek, um, perhaps you want to do a, a roundup of uh, a survey of the issues, uh, how you're seeing it at the moment um, after the conventions um, and what the key issues are that you're seeing going to be playing out during this election. Thank you, Leon, and hello again to everybody. Um, as you all know, we are in the midst of the 2020 presidential election, which I believe is going to be the most consequential presidential election of this century, and ranking, in fact, is one of the most consequential in American history. The candidates are, of course, on the Democratic side, former Vice President Joe Biden and California Senator Kamala Harris, and on the Republican side, sitting Vice President Mike Pence and our current president, Donald Trump. And it is shaping up to be a classic contest between visions of the country. Biden is running a campaign which he states quite clearly is for the soul of America, to reclaim our democracy and our leadership in the world, all of which he thinks has been lost, not hopelessly yet, but certainly damaged by the Trump administration. Donald Trump's running what you could call a classic Republican law and order campaign. He is offering to defend the country against disorder. And he defines that disorder as anarchists and rioters who are gonna come into the suburbs demonstrators who are burning buildings in Portland or Seattle, immigrants who come in from across our border, and the Democrats, who he now claims are a socialist party, and that Joe Biden is a danger not only to the country, but to God himself. So pretty stark contrasting views as we set out. 
So um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Biden campaign, what do you think of the issues that they're going to be hitting on? Um, uh, A little louder, please. What, what do you think the Biden issues, are, what the Biden campaign, how are they going to try and control the issues and keep focus on a set of issues that work for them? What do you think those issues are going to be? Well, the main issue that the Biden campaign would like to run on has been Donald Trump's response to the pandemic, to his failure to protect the people of the United States against this virus. And of course, there's ample evidence for that fact. The United States has the highest rate of infection in the world and the highest overall death rate. And these are real facts. You can't call them fake news, as the president would like to do. And Americans across the country are experiencing not only the fear of the virus, but of course, the effects of the shutdown on the economy. And so that's what Biden would prefer to do. And it ties in with a strong issue of health care for the Democrats. As probably most of you know, the Affordable Care Act was passed under President Obama. It's called Obamacare and it increased health care for over 20 million people. Trump ran and said he would abolish it. He hasn't, but he continues to attack it. And health care ties in to how we are handling the coronavirus. Now, obviously, Trump would prefer not to run on those issues. His position now is that the crisis is over, the virus is being contained, there'll be a vaccine before uh, perhaps November. So we shouldn't worry. What we should worry about is the socialist Democratic Party and they're coming to get you in the suburbs. Now, the Biden campaign does not want a campaign on fear issues, but they know and they've learned from past experience, you have to answer these charges. So for example, President Trump went to Kenosha, Wisconsin a few days ago where there had been various protests, some violence in response to the shooting of a black man 11 times in the back by the police. President Trump met with police. He toured burnt out buildings, did not meet with the family of the injured man, did not meet with local black leaders. Today, Vice President Biden has been to Kenosha. He went to a church service with local civil rights leaders. He talked to the man who'd been shot, he met with his parents. So a very different approach to Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah, and um, do, you know, the, the thing that is remarkable about Trump is that uh, he's able to uh, control the, the media cycle with, uh, with, with the way he um, shapes issues and, and the like. Um, he seems to continue to be doing that. Like today, um, you were saying earlier to us, that um, he's calling for people to vote twice. Um, is, is, do you think that that's a strength of his or is it uh, less of a strength than it was say in the four years ago in the, in the Clinton-Trump um, contest? Well, it was certainly a strength four years ago when he was the challenger because he had no record. So he could criticize Mrs. Clinton, he could talk about her emails, he could make fun of her health. Um, he could say anything he wanted because he said so many things, tweeted so frequently, people couldn't keep up with the accuracy or inaccuracy. And of course, he was playing to his supporters. But this time he is the President of the United States. So it has a very different effect when he says things and he does not stay on his own message. So for example, when he went to Kenosha, um, he referred to the shooting of the man by the police is similar to an error in golf, to a missed putt. I mean, that's stepping on your own message. No one, even people who may be overly sympathetic to him, think that shooting someone is the same as missing a golf putt. Um, he today suggested that because he's skeptical of people voting by mail, which is going to be a necessity given the fact that we haven't controlled the virus, that now he's suggesting people should vote twice. They should vote in person and they should vote by mail just to test the system. Well, actually encouraging people to do that's a felony. Uh, so he tends to step on his messages 
and look unpresidential, almost as if he were the challenger instead of the sitting president. If, if we go back to the, the law and order issue, um, one of the things that, uh, Derek, you first said to me when I uh, arrived in the United States uh, was that to understand U.S. politics, you needed to understand that it all begins and is all about uh, race. Um, I, I um, didn't, didn't disbelieve you, but I didn't necessarily believe you entirely that it was just about the one factor. Um, and that's where it starts. But it seems like race is becoming um, the uh, dividing line in this election like never before. Is this different this time in terms of campaign, in terms of the way that race issues are being addressed? Well, it's more explicit, but this has been a long-term development in American politics. And what I meant, I think, when I told you that a few years ago is that race, while not the single factor, is the most basic explainer of American politics. I mean, we used to have two parties in this country that had different wings. You had a Democratic Party that, of course, historically had supported slavery uh, with Southern congressmen and senators representing the Democrats and a more liberal union wing that supported FDR and the New Deal. And you had a Republican Party that was the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party that won the Civil War. And in that party, you had conservative farmers, you had big business, but you also had liberal Republicans who were pro-environment, pro-civil rights. All of that has shifted over the past 50 to 60 years. So that now the Democrats are the party of minorities, of Jewish voters, of upper income liberals who live in the suburbs. And the Republican party, sadly, is overwhelmingly a party of white people. Now that's not healthy for a country, but that's in fact the situation. And so you can't help but see how a race becomes framed in terms of race. And then when you have a candidate who plays on racial fears, and let me say, this is not new. When George Bruss Sr. ran for president, he famously put out an ad, which was called the Willie Horton ad, which showed a black convict who had gone out on a furlough in Massachusetts. And the Democratic candidate was Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, who'd okayed this furlough program. I'm sure you have furlough programs in New Zealand. But in this case, Willie Horton then committed a terrible crime. The ad showed a revolving door of a scary looking black man and suggesting that if Michael Dukakis became president, these kinds of black criminals would be spreading out through everybody's neighborhood. It was a fear campaign. And later, George Bush Sr. was embarrassed, but it helped him win the election. And so the Republican Party has embraced this strategy of appealing to white people and in the past, it's been less explicit. They've used code words. Ronald Reagan talked famously about welfare queens without saying the word black, but the implication was a black woman whose taxes from hardworking people she spent on a Cadillac. Uh, there was talk about welfare as being for undeserving people, i.e. people of color. And Trump's just made that very explicit. I mean, he led the fight to deny that Barack Obama was even an American citizen. And he's rolled into that immigration. And of course, said awful things about Mexican immigrants. So he's rolled Latinos into blacks and made it about more than just one race. And that's a sad state of affairs, but that is the terrain on which our election is being fought. So you've done a lot of work in, in, in sports diplomacy and its impact on um, internationally. Uh, the question I've got is there's just been a, uh, a players strike. Um, um, how, how big has that been? Uh, what's the reach of that been like? And what do you think the reaction has been? And, and has it had any impact on the election? It's historic. I mean, a few years ago, people may remember one football player, Colin Kaepernick, took a knee to protest racial injustice in the country. And he was not supported by teammates. He was attacked by the owners of the football teams. And he was made fun of and criticized by President Trump and lost his job. I mean, what happened last week was that 
the Milwaukee Bucks, who were part of the NBA in playoffs, one player, George Hill, just said I'd had it. I mean, this another black man had been shot. This was too much, and he wasn't going to play. And he told his teammates, and they had a discussion, and they decided not to come out onto the floor. And then they told the other team what they were doing, and the other team agreed. And from there, it spread. In over two days, every single major sports league in the United States canceled their games. Major League Baseball, Major League Hockey, National Hockey Association, Women's Basketball, Major League Soccer. It was unprecedented. And what's important about it is not the particular event, but that for the first time we have national figures, highly paid athletes, men and women, who are not only using their sports position to protest, but they're going to use their resources to be involved in the election. So LeBron James, probably the best basketball player in the United States, has created a foundation that is going to help people get out the vote around the country and especially in minority areas. He already made an arrangement with the LA Dodgers to use Dodger Stadium as a large voting location for the election so people could vote outside at the field. And there's now a movement among most sports teams to provide their sports arenas as voting polling places for the election. So I think it's really interesting and important. We'll see you know, how it all goes, but it's, again, historic in terms of what's happened. What's also historic, Leon, is that the response to the killing of George Floyd, where the man placed the policeman's knee on his neck, it had an extraordinary effect on white people in the United States. And as a result, there have been demonstrations and protests overwhelmingly peaceful across the United States in the past few months in which over 20 million Americans, mostly white, have participated. So there may be a new civil rights movement, especially propelled by young people that's, that's growing. And that too, I mean, this is all a big deal. We don't know the outcome yet, but it is unprecedented. I guess too, with sport, it has enormous reach into every home in the United States. Um, so that reach actually puts the issue front and center. Um, do you think that Biden has positioned um, uh, himself um, and his vice president running mate, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, well in those issues? Um, you've got, you, you said before, you can't just let the attacks lie. You have to go and, and, and front them straight away when the attacks come. Do you think that they um, uh, have the ability to manage um, the swift boat style campaigns or the Willie Horton type campaigns? Well, yes, they are prepared, I can tell you, inside the campaign. But let me point out a few important things about Joe Biden. Um, he was not the front runner in the Democratic primary. And in fact, um, his campaign was saved by black voters in the South Carolina primary. So he owes a big debt, especially to black women who helped propel turnout. And he was seen quite rightly as the more reasonable, electable, centrist alternative to self-declared democratic socialist Bernie Sanders. But it was black voters that really propelled him to winning the nomination. And so he chose as his running mate, a woman of color, Senator Kamala Harris, from California. And she is very photogenic, very smart, a former prosecutor. So not someone who's seen as a protester, as an activist, but she has incredible ties into the black community. She went to Howard University, an all black traditional university, mm. over 80,000 professional alumni of that university. She's reaching out to them. She's Biden's ambassador to the young leaders of the Black Lives Movement. She's going to play an incredibly important role in the campaign. Biden himself used the word systemic racism. We've never had a candidate for national office at the presidential level use those words before. He understands it, but he's also a smart politician. So he's not endorsing defunding the police. He understands you need a police 
service, but he understands too that you can reform policing and part of his campaign will be to enact those reforms. So I think they have a handle on this, but it's of course a very fluid situation. Uh, and as you already mentioned, President Trump is gonna do everything he can to inflame the situation, to try and scare white voters. And, and how's, how's the Democrat party um, compared to four years ago? Is it, is it more united, more disciplined? Is it more likely to get turnout up? Um, because there were um, parts, last, last election, there were poor turnout. So, you know, mm -hmm. clearly the party wasn't as cohesive as it could have been. The party is the most united I've seen it in my lifetime. Partly it's fear of Donald Trump, of course, but also because people understand now that you have to compromise your views either from the right or the left or the center to form a united party to win an election in the United States if you are the party that is a coalition of different groups, of different minority groups, Blacks, Latinos, gay activists, Asian Americans, women activists, um, Jewish activists, upper income whites. I mean, it's, a, it's not as simple as the Republican Party where Donald Trump can take it over, say America first, uh, let's make America great again, which some people read as make America white again, uh, and let's go for it. The, the Democrats have a history of fighting among themselves, and they are not doing it this time. Everybody is behaving very well. Biden campaign has been very smart about including young policy experts and organizers from the Sanders campaign, from Senator Warren's campaign, people who ran to the left of him, and from Pete Buttigieg, ran as the gay candidate's campaign. So um, as I say, it's as united as I've ever seen it. Yeah, and, and um, we see in the New York Times today that um, FDA is, um, uh, well, the, the vaccine and getting a vaccine approval and, and having that as part of the campaign in terms of the timing that the vaccine is going to ride to the rescue. Um, is that a risk to um, the Democrat chances that uh, he can use the, you know, the organs of government to, uh, to, to his advantage in around dealing with the COVID risk? Well, he's, the president's been doing that for the entire time he's been in office. I mean, he unprecedentedly hosted his party convention in the White House. He used the People's House for partisan purposes. I mean, and it looked like a, you know, a family convention. Most of the speakers were his immediate family. So, you know, he, he will try and use it. But again, here's the reality. I don't think there will be a vaccine that can go out by November. And we are, may have a resurgence in the fall when the regular flu season steps up. Yeah, we're starting. Um, yeah, you're starting to see uh, the Midwest uh, with a slight, it's not small numbers relatively compared to earlier this year, but we are starting to see with all the kids going back to college, um, uh, spikes in uh, COVID infection across the Midwest in particular, and in places like Northern Car Carolina. So it's, it's not like that's gonna go away between now and no. the- uh, University of Southern Carolina just announced they went back to school, a thousand students tested positive. 28%. Um, you can't just wish this away. And because of the awful way that the Trump administration has handled it, individual institutions, cities, and states have not been given the supplies, or the support. And then the message from the White House half the time is that it's a hoax, you don't have to wear your mask, don't take it seriously, it will go away, which makes it harder for a mayor or a governor or a public health official to get a unified response. Yeah, so the, the other question I've got is, um, uh, in terms of the economy, do you see that um, between now and the election, the Congress doing anything in terms of stimulus and will they have an impact on the election? Well, the first stimulus that was put together by the 
Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin with Sam, Nancy Pelosi, I think was effective in reducing the downside of the virus, but that now has expired. And so far they have not been able to agree on any other stimulus package. And we're already seeing an increase in evictions of small businesses closing right now. And they're gonna, I think, extend into the fall. I'll be surprised if the Democrats and the Republicans can now agree on a package because the president's view is it's not a problem anymore. The virus is going away. And for him, he doesn't really look at the real economy. He looks at the stock market. And the stock market is not about Main Street, about real people and companies. Uh, and we could talk about this at length, but the fact that the stock market has remained relatively high, mainly focused on tech companies that are doing well by this Zoom economy, by staying home or being delivered you know, things from Google and Amazon. So for an average person, most Americans don't hold stock, or if they have any stock at all, it's in a pension fund they never control or see. So having high stock numbers doesn't translate necessarily into more votes for the president. Right. So Nick, next question of you, you obviously are still very connected to the Democrat party. So you'll be seeing um, uh, people emerging as key players in the Biden campaign that will become key players in the Biden administration. Who, who do you think are the ones that uh, the ones that stand out for you who will be very influential uh, and where will they come from? Well, Vice President Biden had some very good advisors in his personal staff. One of the things that uh, we had worked on during the Obama transition was to make sure that the vice president had his own national security advisor and his own economic advisor, and that these individuals sat in at all the top meetings. And yep. so Vice President Biden had a man named Tony Blinken, who'd been in the Clinton administration, very talented foreign policy expert, as his national security advisor. So Tony Blinken is now the major foreign policy advisor to Vice President Biden. And I would say he's the odds on favorite to be national security advisor if Biden is president. A man named Jared Bernstein was the vice president's economic advisor. He's now advising Biden in the campaign. But one of the important things that Jared Bernstein has done is he's reached out to literally hundreds of talented young economists and brought them into working committees inside the campaign. They're already writing memos about key issues, about what the president could do on day one or on day two, not only with regards to the economy, but with regards to healthcare. And so this is gonna be a very well-prepared government should Biden and Harris win. Now, who will take Secretary of State, for example? Uh, there's no one person and there are lots of names that get thrown around. Susan Rice, who'd been ambassador to the UN under President Obama and national security advisor. Samantha Power, who'd been ambassador to the UN. Um, there are a couple of former top foreign service officers who had held high posts. Nicholas Burns, who's now a professor at Harvard and others. And then there's some interesting outliers. The mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, whom you know well, Leon, from your time here as a diplomat. Yeah. Um, He's been hosting events for the Biden campaign. He was on the very small committee that picked the vice president. He, of course, knows the vice president well, since he's the senator from our state of California. But more important, one of the things that Garcetti has done as mayor is organize a global network of cities, including, I believe, the city of Auckland, right. uh, to work on climate change. And climate change is going to be another big issue for the new administration. It is already an issue in California with the huge wildfires we've had this season. I don't know if it'll become a big issue in the campaign, but it is something that Biden will be dealing with almost immediately because he has to decide to return or not into the climate change agreement in Paris. So 
having a mayor who's been working on that issue globally might make a great choice for Secretary of State. And of course, you'd all be happy because he's been to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a very sophisticated um, uh, operator. I saw um, Eric Garcetti introduce uh, um, Shinzo Abe in LA. Um, and um, um, we know that uh, Eric is fluent in um, is Spanish, but he is fluent in Japanese as well. And he was incredible giving his speech in Japanese to introduce um, uh, the prime minister. Oh. He used to teach international affairs at my school, Occidental, so I know him well. <laughs> so, yeah, very polished performer and also understands the Asia Pacific. Um, anybody else that you think, uh, particularly in the Asia Pacific or the Indo Pacific, as we in in interchangeably use the terms now, that will be um, important in terms of uh, the Biden administration, a Biden administration, I should say? Well, I don't think there's any one person, to tell you the truth. I know most of the experts uh, on Japan and on China, and I think what's more important is that the approach, the approach is going to be serious re-engagement. Um, obviously, standing up to China when that is necessary, but also not trying to, which is, I think, impossible, suddenly decouple out of the global economy from China. That's just an impossibility and not good for the global economy. And there are issues like climate change or healthcare controlling pandemics where we have mutual interests with China and where you can speak and talk and negotiate with them on those issues. Um, so re-engaging smartly with China and dropping this stupid trade war, I think will be a priority for the team as it gets selected, but they're all going to be smart, talented professionals. Yeah, yeah. So that, that goes to the second part of um, our webinar, which is to talk about the America and the world um, uh, after the election. And I know that you've been giving courses on this topic now for a couple of years, um, uh, Derek, and teaching students about uh, where you think uh, US diplomacy is heading. So be good to get an, an overview of where you think the shift is going to be overall and what that means for uh, New Zealand and other uh, Asia Pacific countries. Well, first off, what's called America's soft power, our influence in the world beyond our economic and military strength, has taken a big hit under Donald Trump because instead of talking about democracy, he's been coddling up to autocrats and dictators. And you can't get him to say a critical word about Vladimir Putin, you know, who just recently tried to kill one of his opponents, Andrei Navalny, with uh, Novichok, a nerve gas developed during the Soviet period by the Russian army. So, um, and he says nice things about Chairman Xi in China. He's friends and buddies with the head of Hungary, Oban. So instead, and he criticizes the leaders of democratic countries. So you're going to see a very different approach from a Biden administration, where we're going to reach out to our democratic allies to work with them uh, and talk seriously about how to deal with autocratic behavior, not only across borders, but even inside countries and to make clear that the United States wants to lead an alliance of democratic countries as we did in the past. Right. Richard Fontaine uh, talked with us about a week ago and his message was, um, um, don't get your hopes up too great for a big change uh, in American foreign policy. Um, <laughs> then, you know, the U.S. is not going to turn into um, a, a Scandinavian uh, country in terms of its um, foreign policy priorities. Um, what, what do you think um, um, uh, New Zealand should expect uh, if uh, um, Joe Biden is elected to be president in terms of uh, the shift for us in terms of how we engage with the United States? And is it, um, uh, will it be a watershed? How would you characterize the way we should uh, perceive it? Well, I think you will be, everyone will be sort of pleased that a more normal America is back. Instead of America first, 
It's going to be America wanting to work with its allies and to lead, not to either dictate or to walk away and say, we only care about America. I mean, that the Trump approach was the break, the abnormal. And so I think people will see us as reappearing and re-engaging. Uh, we're gonna have serious ambassadors, serious diplomatic teams, and we're also gonna listen. I mean, Biden has made quite clear, and so is Tony Blinken, that we're not gonna immediately come back and dictate to the world. We're gonna be listening. We know things have changed in the world. We know there are issues and problems, but it, we're gonna come out. I'm sure someone will come out and have a serious meeting with your prime minister, whether it's Jacinda or someone else after the election, and hear what your concerns are in the region. Uh, and I know you'll probably say, will we bring back the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement? And maybe we'll be able to do that, not immediately, but we're gonna listen to your priorities too. And that's gonna be a very different style of engagement from the current government. And one that over time, I think, is gonna be quite effective because the big issues in the world, healthcare, pandemics, climate change, more equitable economic growth as you restart a new global economy, those are ones that concern everyone. And we wanna have a leadership role, but not to dictate some American outcome yeah. So th three or four um, um, years ago, we, we had a delegation of think tanks from Washington, D.C. come to New Zealand. It was CS CSIS and the Heritage Foundation, and um, I don't know if CNAS was involved, but their message was, uh, wake up New Zealand. Um, uh, the engagement strategy with China has not worked. Um, we're not, uh, they weren't advocating confrontation with China, but they were saying we have to get real and understand that China isn't going to change through uh, engagement uh, and we need to see them as they are. Um, it was a bit of a, a gear change and a, um, a, a, the people that were engaging with the American um, think tankers were taken back because uh, uh, um, I guess we, um, hadn't got to that point of, of that assessment on China. But gradually there's been a bipartisan, bipartisan consensus form that, you know, the things that have been happening in Xinjiang and, and in Hong Kong, that China has changed and it is, um, an engagement needs to be reassessed. You talked about engaging with China positively through climate change and, and other regional issues. So where do you think uh, the consensus is across the United States at the moment in terms of the right diplomatic strategy with China. Um, and uh, how does that distinguish, you know, with, with what uh, the Biden administration is likely to do? Well, we're actually in a dangerous period of U.S.-China relations because China and the Communist Party under Xi's leadership is playing the nationalist card as strongly as they can. Uh, and if you look inside the Chinese media, as I do sometimes through some of my Chinese students, you'll see that they are making fun of the American democratic model. Say, this is what you get. You can't even control the virus. Look how it is. You know, you're all, un you're divided, divisive. Um, your cities are up in flames and people are dying of the virus. We do a better job in China. And if you look at polls right now inside China, the nationalistic view of the world is gaining. And if you look at polls in the United States right now, over 75% have a negative view right now of China. And the president's blaming the pandemic on China has had some effect. Um, the trade war here is not popular and it has affected particular industries in adverse ways. But I don't think it's gonna be a big campaign issue per se. Foreign policy almost never is. Um, but it's absolutely clear that China has changed and that she has taken a much harder line inside the country and in Hong Kong. But that doesn't 
you know, what does that tell us? Um, I don't think it's a surprise to real China experts. And then the question is, what is a smart strategy yep. for dealing with China? It's not an either or question. Certainly, it's not a smart strategy to say, we're going to isolate China and decouple the global economy. That, it's not going to work. And we have the same problem with Russia. Putin's not a good guy. He plays the nationalist card at home, and we know how he treats his opponents, trying to prison them, kill them in some cases. He's trying again, as he did four years ago, to disrupt our election. We just had revealed by the head of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Russian false sites on Facebook. They were trying to push pro-Trump, anti-Biden stories. I guarantee you that Russian interference is gonna continue right through election day and maybe after. So we, again, Russia is a nuclear power. We're not going to not talk to them or deal with them, but we're going to have to have a strategy. And the strategy, both in terms of China and in terms of Russia, works much better if we're united with our allies. So if we're talking to Russia and we have Germany and NATO on our side, and you have somebody as smart and as strong as Chancellor Merkel, or if we're talking to China with a united New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Vietnam, Southeast Asia on our side, then we have a much more powerful voice. Right. I, uh, that's, that's, you touched on um, interference in the elections, and we have a, a question from Diego Sanchez from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Hola um, to Diego. And this question is about cybersecurity. What would you say are the main deterrence measures that are being implemented to prevent cyber attacks in the coming elections? Well, we have increased our capacity of cybersecurity. And we also, uh, the University of Southern California, a friend of mine, is running a cybersecurity project in every one of the states to help protect the local state voting machines in efforts, but it's not easy. I mean, now we know that the Russians are active. We are on the lookout. We shut down their sites as much as we can. I think they're gonna be much less effective. And one of the other interesting factors is four years ago, one of the tricks that the Russians played that was very effective and helped to elect Trump was they pushed Sanders voters towards third party voters. But this year, the third party candidates, none of them poll above 1%. Nobody knows their names. It's gonna be much in the course, Senator Sanders is fully engaged in supporting Biden. It's gonna be much harder for the Russians to push voters to a third party and cut into Biden's vote. What they now wanna do is just as they can disrupt the actual election, cause chaos. Um, I think we're well prepared to defend against that. I can't go into you know super details, but uh, I can tell you it's on everybody's minds, both inside the campaign and in state election offices. Talking about uh, third party candidates, I, I uh, struggle to understand uh, the strategy um, behind Kanye West's um, 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 putting his name forward as, to the presidential election. What, what's your take on that? Um, where does oh, that come from? And is there any is there any value in it, or is it just a sideshow? It's just a silly sideshow. Um, um, Kanye West has many personal issues um, and problems that he plays out in public, and of course, because he said nice things about President Trump, then Trump likes to cause a little trouble and say he hope he runs. And if the Republicans could, it is a strategy to sometimes place a third party candidate or if possible black candidate uh, you know, on ballots in some states to drain off a few votes in a close election. But I think it's going to have no effect whatsoever in this election. Yeah, well, the, the voter suppression was um, one of the strategies in the last campaign. And um, there's a question in here from Kate, which is, you know, the voter disenfranchisement um, levels for the, this coming election. The question is, if the Biden-Harris campaign can mobilize more people of color to vote, do you think that's going to make a significant impact the, this time around? And are you seeing signs of that? Well, 
it has been, again, sadly, the Republican strategy for a number of elections, which is to try and suppress the vote of minority voters. But we are now well aware of this tactic. And there are organized groups in almost every state. People are going to be volunteering to be poll watchers. As I mentioned, many more people are going to be voting by mail. Uh, and the get out the vote effort of this campaign is going to be, although in a different format, because it's not all in person anymore, the most extensive I've seen from a Democratic Party. And I think we will see that minority voters know what is at stake. Um, and the fact that people who've not been active before, it's hard to quantify, but LeBron James and other top figures and athletes, as well as entertainers, are going to be campaigning. They're going to be out there. President Obama is going to be actively campaigning. This is, again, unprecedented. Usually former presidents do not involve themselves in elections after they leave the White House. He knows what's at stake, and he's going to be doing that. Michelle Obama, whose book is still one of the top bestsellers, not only in the U.S., but in the world, and one of the most popular women in the country, is going to be campaigning. So every effort is going to be made to see that everybody who would like to vote actually gets to vote and that the vote gets counted. Do, do you, um, we, we're almost uh, uh, coming to a close. Are there any other questions from people online? Uh, please get them in. But um, what are you going to look for, Derek, um, as we get closer to the election for, um, for points um, or, or polls or, or states or counties or things that give you an indication of where the election is heading? What, what well, are you going to be looking for? Here, here's a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, how early the voting starts in some states and whether the debates come in time to affect that voting. So as people may know, we're going to have three presidential debates. They're televised live. The first one's going to be on September 29th. There'll be two after that. Two of them will be on particular topics with a single moderator. One of them will be in the format of questions from an audience, which is a less sharp format. And there'll be one debate between the vice presidential candidates. Sometimes things can happen in those debates that do affect the outcome of elections. Certainly, if there was like a serious health issue, some of you may have heard that there was a story that had been out, um, not necessarily an incorrect one, that President Trump had suffered some minor strokes and had to go to the hospital. Um, the Republicans have been trying to suggest that Joe Biden is losing it, is not healthy, is not mentally prepared. Then there's a story about President Trump's health. So if something happened on screen live to either of the candidates, that could play a big role. Um, I was talking about the 2008 election around Australia when the debate took place between Senator McCain and the challenger, Senator Obama, right after the financial crisis. And it was a turning point because Senator McCain looked confused. He didn't know what to say or how to respond. He was saying the American economy was perfectly healthy. And Obama looked calm and collected. And I, that was a real turning point, was how Obama responded to a crisis that happened. So we have ongoing crises right now, of course, but something could happen in the next two months that requires a response by both of the candidates, either in international affairs or at home, and how they respond could affect voters. So those are, those are sort of unpredictable factors, but at the moment, uh, the polls have been pretty steady for more than a month. Uh, the, Biden is ahead by eight to nine points. He's ahead in swing states right now uh, and very close in others like Florida. So what will change that? We don't know. But there could be unpredictable events. And of course, campaigns, they have to be prepared to, for that, as do candidates. But in the meantime, they're going to proceed along the tracks that I've already outlined. 
Okay, well, one, one final question before um, you, you, uh, I leave it to you to say anything else that you wanted to, to wrap up with, Derek, which is, do you see a new level of discipline in the way that Joe Biden is presenting himself? Or is it just the way he's always been? Well, Joe Biden is one of the most kind, considerate, caring politicians I've ever met. And as you probably all know, he suffered some awful tragedies in his life. And instead of making him bitter, it's made him more caring. And the thing about Biden is he's a hard person to hate or dislike. And so the Trump campaign is having a hard time demonizing this man. Now, he's known sometimes for talking too long or occasionally a malapropism, but because of the pandemic, he's campaigning in a way that is more disciplined by its very nature. Uh, and he also knows what is at stake. And I think that his humanity is coming through. You'll see it if you watch his coverage that he shows when he meets with people who've suffered tragedy, which is the exact opposite of Donald Trump. Trump has no empathy. He shows no real caring or concern about people who've been dying in the virus, let alone people who've been shot by the police. And I think that comes across to people more almost than any of the issues. Joe Biden's a hard man to dislike, and Donald Trump is a very hard man to like. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a good way of ending it. Do you want to say anything more? Um, but but uh, before you do, um, I want to thank you, Derek. Um, it, uh, we would love to have had you in New Zealand doing a tour of universities and and uh, reaching out to, uh, and talking to the diplomatic community here and people who are interested in foreign affairs. So unfortunately, COVID-19 got in the way. So um, thank you very much for your time here and we'll continue to stay very connected um, with you as we get closer to the election. Is there anything you wanted to say before we uh, wrap up the, um, the, the latest uh, NG? Well, I just want to remind everybody that uh, New Zealand is very close to my heart because my great grandfather, was a Mormon missionary in the North Island, and he's the only white fella that has a marae, a meeting house named after him. And so I always welcome the opportunity to come back. I won't come as a missionary. I'll just come as a friend of New Zealand, wearing my Allbirds. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Derek. It's fantastic to, to talk to you once more. Thank you very much, Leon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.